My name is Mike Pissarro. I'm the Policy Director for the Watershed Institute. You have attend, you're joining us for our Technical Friday, New Jersey's Water Supply Master Plan. And if you don't know, the Watershed Institute is celebrating our 75th anniversary, and our mission is keeping water clean, safe, and healthy. Uh, we work to protect and restore our water and natural environment in central New Jersey through conservation, advocacy, science, and education. And we apparently do that as a not. And so our webinar logistics, we are recording this. Is you can find the recording on our YouTube channel, but we will be sending out a link to that. We will provide a copy of the PowerPoints. In fact, I will put a link in as their speakers going on uh, to those PowerPoints as a PDF. If you have a question, please use the question and answer feature of Zoom. It is either on the top of your screen or the bottom of your screen, and we will be monitoring that. Usually we will do questions at the end of the program, but if there's something that I sort of see that I think needs to be sort of done right at the moment, I will interrupt our speakers and ask that question. But in general, it is at the end. Um, Thank everyone for participating in our webinar series, and I greatly appreciate both of our speakers. So we have Jennifer Coffey, uh, who is the Executive Director of the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions, and is on, a, on the Water Supply Advisory Council, uh, and she will be talking to us about the Water Supply Plan. And Laura is the Director of Water Quality and Environment Compliance for New Jersey American Water. Uh, and she's going to be talking to us about uh, New Jersey American Water source water protection um, because, well, that's important to protect our water supply. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer. Um, do you want me to pull up the slides or do you want to pull them up, Jen? I know them myself if that's okay. That uh, is but fine. be allowed to do that. You should be. Okay. Let's see. There we go. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me here today, Mike. Um, it's awesome to, to be able to talk about this water supply plan. I am mildly intimidating, uh, intimidated after <laughs> looking at the participant list. Uh, because there are certainly people who are attending here who know what I'm about to say, and some of them could say it better. So I will ask for their grace and uh, their assistance, hopefully in the chat if I get anything wrong. I uh, am not intending on providing uh, detailed analysis of the water supply plan. This is really a level set of what is this thing and why do we do it? Uh, with a preview as to what is in the draft plan that public comment has just closed on. So with that said, just a little bit about ANJAC in case anybody is new to what an ANJAC is. We are the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions, and we work uh, for more than 55 years to help municipalities make good decisions about the environment. And we do that by working primarily with environmental commissioners but also with green team members, county commissioners, um, elected officials, and certainly at the state level with the governor's office, the legislature, and the DEP. Um, it's our commitment to work uh, at all levels of government, focusing primarily on municipal to create uh, healthier, more equitable communities that protect and restore our natural resources. And we do that in a bunch of different ways. So if you're not familiar with ANJAC, please follow us on social media um, and check out our website. We have a resource center uh, that produces lots of materials and uh, guidebooks and helps municipalities answer questions. We have our own webinars and roundtables, our quarterly report and lots of events. Uh, so please hold the date for our Environmental Congress, which will be September 27th this year. And if you're on an EC or thinking about uh, being on an EC, just know that ANJAC is also your voice in Trenton uh, for the more than 300 municipalities that we work with. So with that said, what's a water supply plan? Well, technically, the Water Supply Management Act directs the DEP to prepare the statewide water supply plan. And this is really an analysis of how much water we have, 
what are the risks and uses of that water and to make recommendations to ensure we have enough clean water to meet all of our needs. Why do we need to do this? Well, because we have interrupted the water cycle with our very being and our everyday lives. So we ride in cars or public transportation that are on roads that water sloughs off of during rain events or snow melt when we do get snow. We live in buildings, we work in buildings, the rain falls on top of those roofs and doesn't infiltrate into the ground, but instead creates sheet flow runoff. <clears throat> so we have interrupted the water cycle in a way that is pretty substantial since we are the most densely populated state in the nation. Just think about New Jersey's history. We're one of the 13 original colonies. Our development um, goes back more than 350 years. And the way we manage water uh, or we try to manage water in a more comprehensive way has really only started in some ways in this century. So we do have the Water Supply Management Act and by that act, the Water Supply Advisory Council, which I sit on as a watershed member, I'm not speaking for the uh, Advisory Council today, I'm speaking as Executive Director of ANJAC, but I do have the privilege of serving on that committee uh, that is supported by uh, DEP staff uh, who have a, an incredible amount of knowledge about our water resources. Uh, and I think a lot of that shows in the draft plan that is out right now. The last plan was out in 2017, and every five years, the Water Supply Management Act says that that plan will be updated. So we're just slightly off pace, uh, but the the plan, the 2017 plan was about 15 years overdue. So we are on a much better schedule now moving forward. I like to think about the water supply plan in its most general terms as a checkbook. So for those who have had checkbooks or managed a ledger at some point, it's uh, what water are we withdrawing and using versus how are we putting it back into the system so that that system can be balanced and we can understand, again, how much water we have to meet all of our needs. And again, why do we do this? Well, because we've got some water issues in New Jersey. So someday I will have the time to put together a collage of, of this area and this photo. So this is um, the Stony Brook meets the Millstone River meets Hurricane Irene. And I thought when I received this photo way back in 2011, this would be the only time I would ever see Route 1 with um, this amount of traffic. But unfortunately, I do have several photos of this area now uh, in this exact same circumstance. So we're seeing big storms in New Jersey. We just simply have too much water, except for when we don't have enough of it. And we're going to talk about some of the, the national and New Jersey specific data that supports this narrative that we've all been observing. We have too much water, except for when we don't have enough of it. And unfortunately, much of it is too dirty. Uh, so we have something wonky called the integrated report. And uh, most of our streams that are monitored, unfortunately, fail for at least one criteria. So think about ecological standards as well. Uh, Think about um, dissolved oxygen that fish need to breathe. If anybody's ever had a fish tank, um, they know that, that fish need a certain amount of oxygen in the actual water um, to be able to survive. Some of the other standards that our waterways fail are nutrients, so phosphorus and nitrogen. We all have heard about a HAB, what a HAB is, harmful algal blooms. Uh, so there are multiple criteria that our waterways could fail. And in terms of quantity, so we've got too much water, except for when we don't have enough, and much of it is too dirty. And why do we care about the ambient water quality when so much of our water goes through water treatment? And, you know, huge kudos to the, the people who run our water treatment plants because they have a bankless job, uh, but they do get yelled at, uh, probably rightfully so, when there's a uh, an issue and we get a boil water advisory. People get real upset, as they should. Um, when there is an issue. And part of the issues that we have when we see impairments in our drinking water come through is because we've got very old infrastructure. And so we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Just in terms of knowing if we've got too much water or not enough water, this is the, the most recent, um, I'll say, chart of where we are in terms of having enough water. And you'll see everything's green. So think stoplight colors. Green is good. Red is concerning. 
Um, yellow is on the way to being concerned. And so the DEP staff do a great job of updating uh, this chart on the right weekly. And it's done according to uh, different regions in New Jersey. Now, if I had a magic wand or uh, better magic powers than I have, I would erase all the political boundaries and redraw them on watershed lines. And I think that would make life a lot easier in terms of managing our water resources. But alas, we don't have that option right now. So we manage based on um, different regions and you'll see those on the map. The map on the left matches the chart on the right in terms of um, our drought regions. And I check this, this website, um, I just Google NJ drought and this will pop up for you, but the full link is, is down the bottom for you. I look at this at least weekly, um, particularly when I know we haven't had rain in some time because I wanna make sure I have an understanding as a member of the Water Supply Advisory Council and also executive director of a statewide group that I have an understanding of where we are in terms of our water resource management. Right now, all things look good. There aren't any concerns um, in terms of the amount of water that's available. Uh, this is a great chart on the right too because it gives you um, precipitation, stream flow, as well as reservoir data and groundwater data. So it's. It's one of my go-to regular websites. What does that chart and the map start to look like when we do have drought concerns? So not when we have too much water, but when we're concerned we don't have enough, that's when you start to see the stoplight colors will, will pop up. So green is good, yellow is on the way to being concerned. Orange um, and red are definitely of concern. As I said, right now we are good, but we have seen a number of drought warnings and watches uh, since the year 2000. And why is that? It's because precipitation and climate is changing. It's not because we are managing our water substantially differently. We are still keeping an eye on how much water are we withdrawing? How much are we putting in? We're always getting a better understanding of the system. We're becoming more efficient. This is uh, a chart from our New Jersey Office of Climatology, which is a great resource. Dr. David Robinson is a wealth of knowledge and runs a great team over there. So this shows data going back to 1895, and some of you have probably seen this, of uh, New Jersey's weather up until, uh, I think it's last month is when we've got data on here. It might, nope, it's the end of last year, sorry. So the end of 2023. The general thing to look at here is there are more blues, blue is cold, red, pink and red are warm. There are more blues earlier in our record keeping than there are reds. Reds are, are coming up more recently. So these are the hottest, sorry, I might not have said this. This is the coldest and the hottest um, months that we've seen in New Jersey's record keeping history for weather. So it shows us that the climate is getting warmer that has an effect on how we are receiving water through the water cycle. Uh, this is just another way of representing that data. And so we are seeing that we are having more precipitation. Why is that? Because warmer climate, warmer air can hold more water. That's one of the reasons we see these big dumps of rain that are coming into communities and they're seeing three, four, five, I've heard nine inches of rain in a few hours in certain communities. And this is where we get the flooding. So that gives us the too much water. This is again showing the, the hottest months. I know globally, April of 2024 was the hottest April in uh, our record keeping history. Uh, in New Jersey, let's see, um, we are, we're not there for last April. Um, but you can see that we, we've got the ninth warmest, the third warmest December, the ninth warmest March. If I spread this out over a number of years, which we saw up in this data chart, you'll see that again, we're getting more reds more recently than we had 100, 129 years ago. So the climate's getting warmer. We all know this. Um, we know this is because of an increased amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So this is one of the things, and I'm gonna talk about the new elements of the water supply plan in a minute. This is one of the things that the um, water supply plan is looking to tackle. 
the draft water supply plan that's out right now and public comment has closed on it, but it is available to still read and review and, and talk about with your friends. Uh, so we are looking to manage, yes, the amount of water we're using, yes, keeping an eye on to what we're recharging, but also looking at what are the impacts of climate change, um, as well as looking at our infrastructure and how that affects our, our water supply and how we move water around. As I said, from a very high level, the water supply plan is looking at the water we're using and the water we're putting back into the system. So we are looking at our streams and our rivers, so our surface waters, and then this is a map of our groundwater. So we're also looking at our, our um, aquifers. We have both confined and unconfined aquifers in New Jersey, so they are exactly what they sound like. Confined, the water generally stays put. It doesn't move um, to other aquifers. It doesn't necessarily spill out into streams because there are interactions that happen between our groundwaters and our surface waters. Um, unconfined aquifers, the water moves more readily. And so there might be connections to the Delaware River um, or to the Hudson or to um, the ocean. There are also... Um, perched aquifers that pop out particularly in the pines. Uh, so one of my favorite aquifers to kayak on is the, the Batstow River, and that opens up um, into uh, an area that the, the Pinelands Preservation Alliance, Pinelands Adventure has a canoe and kayak livery um, that you can go and kayak on. It's, it's one of my favorite things to do. So we're looking at, again, a checkbook analysis, a balancing of our surface waters, our streams, our rivers, our reservoirs, how we're using them, how the water is being put back into the system and the same for groundwater. So the water supply plan for 2024, I will say, again, not speaking as a member of the water supply council, but I will say that the 2024 plan is the most comprehensive plan we have had to date. And so it expands on the previous plan, the 2017 plan, in ways that are absolutely necessary. And unfortunately, there are still questions because none of us have a completely accurate crystal ball to be able to understand what the impacts um, of climate change, shall we say, are going to be in 50 years. We have a pretty good idea and we've got great data sets, but there are conditions that and assumptions that are put into those models moving forward. Um, I think this plan is worthy, especially if you're a professional working in the water, water world of taking some time and digging in and looking at particularly the new sections on um, climate change, uh, because these are going to have uh, impacts on the way that we work and the data that we're trying to collect and understand to make big investment decisions moving forward about our infrastructure, about our land use, about our water use policies moving forward. The previous plan, I just want to make a note, in 2017 also made some big strides into uh, looking at population data and looking at where New Jersey is growing in terms of population and um, where we're moving away from. So New Jersey is a pretty diverse area in terms of having urban, suburban, and rural living and working spaces. We also have a lot of agriculture happening in New Jersey. That's certainly a big water use. I'm fully supportive of having enough clean water uh, to be able to grow our Jersey tomatoes and corn. And we were talking about strawberries this morning and all the wonderful things that we grow in New Jersey. But we need to make sure that we are using water wisely where we can so that we can have it available for um, our other uses. One of the other things that's happening with climate change that I didn't mention earlier when we were on our, our data slides that I do want to note is that we are seeing that we are getting bigger storms, we're getting more rain, but we are also experiencing and expected to experience, the modeling data shows us, longer periods of dryness in between. Now I'm not calling that a drought because a drought has certain indicators, especially whether you're talking about a, an agricultural drought or a drinking water drought, uh, 
but there are longer periods of dryness in between the big storms that are expected. So we've got to find more efficient and effective ways of managing our water supply. So maintaining and holding the floodwaters in ways that make sense so that we can use it when we do have those longer periods of dryness. And so that's just at the precipice of, of some of the things that I think this water supply plan is starting to get to. Now, here are the big exciting things. Um, I already gave it away in terms of climate change that are new for the first time in this water supply plan. Yes, I know I said for the first time, do I think we should have been look, looking at it before? Yeah, absolutely. But we didn't have the data available. And um, there's also politics. Sometimes the politics are not right. So that's that's all I'll say about that. And, and you all know the history of, of New Jersey politics. Um, so we do have climate change considerations in terms of precipitation, in terms of infrastructure. Uh, there are environmental justice considerations. So this is the first plan that's developed uh, while we have the new, I keep calling it new, it's several years old now, but it still feels new. Uh, and it was is such an important uh, piece of legislation, the environmental justice law. And so this plan had environmental justice advisors uh, involved in stakeholder engagement in developing this whole plan and certainly in recommendations and analysis of data that are specific to overburdened communities. Uh, that's a, a legally definable term. You can find more about it on the, the DEP's website that talks about areas that have an overburden of pollution. And those areas uh, most frequently coincide with black, brown, low income communities. Uh, the third thing that is new in this uh, new in this 2024 draft water supply plan is the consideration of water quality. So the old way of thinking in terms of quantity was or water supply was we're just dealing with the quantity, right? We just need the mass volume available and we'll worry about the quality another time. We'll worry about the quality through treatment. We'll worry about the quality through other plans. Well, we've learned that quality and quantity are much more integrated and they will be moving forward. For example, if a water source is too contaminated or too hazardous to use, then that takes, because the quality and the quality is impaired, that takes it out of consideration for quantity. So we've had new regulations uh, that are passed in New Jersey. And I'm thankful to say that the EPA has followed New Jersey's lead in creating national regulations for perfluorinated compounds. So these we often refer to as forever chemicals. Uh, we have also seen a lot of, particularly since 2019, uh, an increase in harmful algal blooms. And so we know that these can be um, toxic, particularly to dogs. Uh, for ingesting, but they can cause some great uh, digestional distress in humans uh, if they're ingesting uh, waters that are uh, polluted with a HAB. So looking at the potential for water sources to be taken offline or out of consideration uh, because of the forever chemicals, because of HABs and any other future um, known water quality impairments that we wanna look at are also considered in this water supply plan. So these are huge strides. These are great benefits to the people of New Jersey who rely on clean, safe drinking water to be able to take into account climate change, to be able to look at the environmental justice issues for communities that already have an overburden of pollution and how can we do better for them and looking at the emerging contaminants that we refer to as perfluorinated and harmful algal blooms. So as I said before, this is, this is just some more data to show you that um, New Jersey's getting more water. So we can expect to continue to receive more volume of precipitation in New Jersey. So you can see that this is an increasing line over time from, uh, 1900, I thought it went out back to 1895. That's the weather data that goes back to 1895 up until the present. And the modeling data moving forward shows us that we will continue to receive more rain, more precipitation. But again, 
that precipitation is going to be interrupted by longer periods of dryness in between. So it's a new balancing act that we have to create. In general, we are going to see, or the modeling data shows us to expect to see more precipitation in North Jersey than South Jersey. Just a quick note about this modeling data, because if you're following this through the NJ Pact rules or the inland flood hazard rules that just came out, so the NJ Pact rules are the protecting against climate threat rules. These rules are based on this data. This is um, what we refer to as Atlas 14 modeling data. And so this data takes into account the fact that the uh, the Arctic, the prevailing Arctic winds are starting to collapse. So in the winter, if you hear about, oh my gosh, we're getting an Arctic blast and it's gonna be really cold. It usually only lasts a day, two days, maybe three. That's because the prevailing Arctic winds that usually stay up at the Arctic are starting to fall down. And so we get their weather. We're also seeing a collapse of the Gulf Stream. And every once in a while, we see a really alarming article that comes out about that. Uh, and so the Atlas 14 modeling data takes into account the fact that the prevailing winds at the Arctic and the Gulf Stream that affects weather largely on the east coast of the United States and in Western Europe are starting to collapse. This is climate change. These systems are slowing down and they're falling out of their normal patterns. This has huge impacts on the amount of precipitation when we receive precipitation precipitation. It also affects things like migration patterns um, because we're seeing changes in whales and their food sources. So there, there are large global system changes happening. And what this modeling data tells us is that if we do our job and we reduce greenhouse emissions, greenhouse gas emissions moderately over what they are today, these are the impacts that we will see. So this is scenario planning. If we don't do our job well, and we don't reduce greenhouse gas emissions over what they are today, this story is gonna be worse. We will see more rain. We will see more collapse of global systems. So that's just a note to, we need to do everything we can to be more resilient to, to the impacts of climate change, as well as reduce greenhouse gases as much as possible, as fast as possible. So back to the water supply plan specifically, one of the other things it looks at, um, in addition to precipitation volumes and consideration of climate change, is it looks at sea level rise. It also looks at um, saltwater intrusion and the, adva the advancement of saltwater intrusion. So with sea level rise, there are several um, points of measurement. We're looking at Sandy Hook. We're looking um, down in the Atlantic County area. Uh, I did not pull out all of the recommendations. It's a very robust report. I encourage you to go and look at it. Um, so again, we're looking at precipitation. We're looking at sea level rise. We're also looking at saltwater intrusion up the Delaware. And we just had a meeting this morning and um, the saltwater line is below where it normally is. And that has to do with the fact that we've got enough water in the system right now. There's enough fresh water and the fresh water pushes the saltwater line back. So it's, it's really a pressure issue. Um, when we don't have enough fresh water and we're pulling more out than is going back in, then the salt water starts to creep in. So think of it like a straw um, and how the water goes up and down in the Delaware. The 800 foot Atlantic Sands um, aquifer off of the Atlantic County region is a little different because there are interactions there, much of which happen under the ocean. There are interactions that happen between a freshwater aquifer and the ocean. And so as we pull, again, like a straw, as we pull more freshwater out of the Atlantic sands, <coughs> excuse me, we see more, more saltwater intruding in. So keeping an eye on saltwater intrusion, specifically down in the Atlantic City and the Cape May area, we already have, oh gosh, at least one, there might be two. I I'm blanking in my memory right now, so, um, desalinization plants in Cape May. We also have another one up in North Jersey, but that's a different story. Uh, and so really looking at, again, making sure we have enough clean water to meet all of our needs, agriculture, drinking water, business. We have to keep an eye on um, saltwater intrusion as well because we are a coastal state. I'm a little out of order here. Uh, but the water quality considerations, this is uh, some of the detailed information that's in the draft 2024 map. Uh, 
takes a look at, these are uh, the perfluorinated we were talking about, the forever chemicals. And so this shows us, um, hang on here. Oops, I've got a repeat of these, sorry. There's supposed to be four different maps here instead I've repeated the same two. So that's my bad. I'll fix this presentation moving forward. Mike, I can get you a revised version if that's helpful. Uh, but know that this plan is looking at increased contamination in terms of, um, or looking at, not increase, this is this has been existing for a while, uh, is looking at the quality of water that's available, knowing that there are now tr new treatment requirements for these areas, and they may need to come offline either temporarily or permanently, depending on how well these water sources can be treated. And if you've got water quality taking water quality concerns taking a uh, a water source offline in terms of its availability, then that becomes a quantity issue because then we have less water to deal with. So just rounding the bend here, uh, because I wanna turn it over to my co-presenter today, Laura, uh, there are lots and lots of recommendations in the report. If you just wanna go to, okay, so what do we do about it? What do we do about the impacts of climate change? What do we do about aging infrastructure? What do we do about uh, sea level rise and saltwater intrusion? Go to chapter eight, the recommendations and action items of the report, because there are lots of recommendations. Some of them are big, hairy, scary, and require a lot of investment. And other ones are the kind of things and the common sense approach that a lot of watershed groups like the Watershed Institute and others have been advocating for for years, um, and really making great strides in protecting our water resources through installation of rain gardens, um, reestablishment of buffers, uh, reducing the amount of chemicals that we're using on lawns so that we can reduce the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus and HABs that we're seeing in our, our water bodies. Uh, some of them are technical government recommendations. So when we do see an issue in terms of the amount of water that we have available uh, because we haven't had enough rain in some time or a water source has to come offline. It gives the DEP uh, you know, more authority in a quicker way to respond. Uh, our, our situation with regarding water now is behind the times in terms of our regulatory structure. Our regulatory structure needs to be updated to allow us to act more quickly, I should say, so that the DEP and the professionals there can make decisions that are more protective um, rather than needing to go through some political rungs and say, oh, is this the right time to be able to announce this? What else is happening in the world? Um, I am a big fan of putting the control in the professionals and the people who have spent their academic and professional careers really making sure that we have enough clean, safe water and giving them um, more control to be able to take action more quickly. So there are some regulatory fixes as well. But certainly public education, public education, public education um, and outreach about what to do when this happens. I mean, we've all seen, you know, the household that is watering their lawn while it's raining, while we're in a, a drought watch. And so getting out um, better education so people stop doing that and we can manage our water resources better. Uh, so this is just us. Again, you can follow Anjack on social media. If you happen to be an EC member uh, or you'd like to be an EC member or an individual member, you can take our member interest survey. You can use the QR code here, uh, scan it with your camera app. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. Um, again, this was meant to be a broad overview of what the heck the water supply plan is and what it's aiming to do. Um, feel free to ask me questions. You can send emails directly to me or to our general email info at anjack.org. Uh, and then if I can't answer them, I will go and ask one of the professionals at the DEP, hey, how do I answer this question uh, to try to get you the information you need? Again, I, I really encourage you to spend some time, particularly with Chapter 8 of the new water supply plan, because it's... Um, I think it's a document that that serves us well here in New Jersey. Thank you very much, Jen. Uh, while Laura is pulling up her slides, just wanted to point out two couple things. So I put uh, PDFs of the slides in the chat earlier. 
So you can uh, find those. I also put into the chat a link to the water supply plan uh, information page. And I'm about to put into the chat uh, two webinars that we did last year um, in part with New Jersey American Water on forever chemicals. Uh, as Jen mentioned, those. So those will be there. And Laura, again, thank you. And I will turn it back over to you. Thank you. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, and can see my screen, yes. correct? Yep. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again um, for having me here. As um, Michael introduced me, I'm the Director of Water Quality and Environmental Compliance for New Jersey American Water. Um, and I'll be going over a little bit about um, source water protection uh, for um, New Jersey American water, but in general for drinking water utilities. So the agenda, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about New Jersey American water, um, what are sources of drinking water supply, uh, basically as it relates to the water supply plan, um, talk about source water protection, partnership and collaborations, which is the, the, the biggest item in source water protection, and um, give you some resources for water quality reports. So starting off, um, New Jersey American Water is the largest regulated water and wastewater service provider in the state of New Jersey. You can see the map here um, where we provide water and wastewater services in the dark blue and um, water services alone in the light blue. And um, we have some wastewater in Bergen County, which is in green there. Um, we have in New Jersey, we have approximately 860 employees that serve um, almost 3 million people. Um, and we have 668 water service, uh, 660,000 water service customers and 64,200 wastewater service customers. I just want to give a shout out to those 860 employees, the ones that are really out in the field, maintaining our infrastructure and really working 24-7, 365 during emergencies, when there is a power outage, when there is a main break to continue to keep the water flowing. I know I appreciate um, those team members and I just wanted to give them a shout out. So a little bit about our infrastructure. Um, so as Jen just talked about, a source of supply, source of drinking water supply. So for New Jersey American water, 75% of our source of uh, drinking water supply comes from surface water, 21% comes from groundwater, and 4% comes from purchased water. So if you looked at the water supply plan, when we talk about purchased water, that's really those interconnections and those transfers that the water supply plan discusses. Uh, we have seven surface water treatment plants, um, 222 groundwater well facilities, and 21 wastewater treatment plants, and lots and lots of miles of water and sewer pipe water storage facilities, which are those lovely tanks that you pass on the highways that have our beautiful logo on them, and 280 water and wastewater pumping stations um, that really keep the system going and the, our wonderful field staff maintain every day, like I said, 24-7, um, 365. Uh, and that's just a picture of Round Valley Reservoir, which is one of our sources. It is managed by New Jersey Water Supply Authority. So what is source water? Um, I, I know I said this before, but this is the EPA definition. So it refers to uh, sources of water such as rivers, streams, lakes, reservoirs, springs, and of course, of course groundwater that provide public drinking water supplies and private wells. Um, and source water protection includes a variety of actions and activities aimed at safeguarding, maintaining, and improving the quality and quality, quantity and quality of sources of drinking water and their contributing areas, meaning their watersheds. Now, um, as far as the uh, water supply and plan is concerned, when it comes to water protection, um, I would look at chapter five that focuses a little bit about uh, on it, but of course, throughout the plan, uh, it aims at discussing what are some best ways and, and expanded ways that we can do that in New Jersey. So protecting uh, drinking water supply. So. For New Jersey American, um, and as it should be for any water utility, it would be a priority to provide clean and reliable drinking water to the communities that we serve. And of course, that starts 
with our source water. As Jen alluded to, um, it is much easier to treat clean water than it is to uh, treat contaminated water. It is easier for employees and of course, um, a less of a, of a financial impact on our customers. Unfortunately, in New Jersey, um, that is not always the case, as Jen alluded to and had some um, pictures in there of uh, of the occurrence of contaminants in New Jersey. If you scroll through the water supply plan, um, you could find a lot of those in there um, of how New Jersey is impacted. So when it comes to, again, protecting drinking water supplies, I, uh, I grabbed the screenshot from the EPA. It's a seven, seven step process that really, um, whether it is a, a state agency or a water supplier or um, really anyone trying to help protect drinking water supplies can work to um, include in, in their action plan. So the first step is to delineate the source water protection area. So a lot of the times that would be the watersheds and certainly um, the plan and New Jersey DP talk a little bit about the delineation of those watersheds in New Jersey. Having an inventory of known potential sources of contamination. Um, again, as Jen mentioned, New Jersey is extremely populated. So having an inventory of what is within your uh, source water Water protection area is important in order to prepare to uh, respond in case something goes wrong um, and some of that potential source of contamination is released. Uh, determine susceptibility of public water systems to contaminant um, sources, right? We look at our inventory and say, how would uh, some something, uh, that potential of contamination, how would it impact us? Would we be able to treat it? Would be, would be, would we be able to analyze for it? When I engage the public, um, you know, being able uh, to be aware of what you can do um, and also be understanding why we're protecting our source waters, that, that's all part of it. Um, again, developing an action plan that's part of the protection phase uh, of source water protection. Um, you want to identify and prioritize any activities that you need to do in order to protect Um the watershed or your water supply. Some of it is it can be as simple as uh, security around that. Uh, sometimes it could be mon just monitoring because uh, you know if if it's a river or stream, it's it would be incredibly hard to to protect um, that. But certainly there's ways to do that. Um, source of drinking water. Uh, protecting it by implementing protective actions, which I just mentioned, which is part of the plan, and evaluating your plan. So right um, on an annual basis, we, uh, New Jersey American Water, go back and evaluate our plan. So really, as they go through these seven steps that the EPA has published and recommend, New Jersey American Water or American Water really brings it down from seven to four, make it easier. Um, but all seven are included in this. So we, as I said, we delineate, we assess what's out there, and then we monitor, 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 and I'll talk a little bit about monitoring in a in a slide. But um, you know, we we have an incredible team that spends all their time just monitoring the water quality of our source water, uh, what our water treatment processes are doing, how they're doing, and of course our distribution systems. Um, so that is my team's number one priority, uh, and, and we do that day in and day out. Uh, I would say about 200,000 different uh, analysis or parameters that we monitor for a year. And then of course, like, like I said, you have to have a source water protection plan. You have to have an emergency response plan. And for us, we review them annually. Uh, it's incredibly important to have an emergency response plan. Uh, communicate that plan with your partners if you plan on having them involved. Um, and absolutely, absolutely review it, look at it, refresh your memory, what's in there. If there is an emergency, pull it out and use it. And of course, update it if something seems out of place or something could be better. Um, it's something that we practice and something that helps us significantly in case of an emergency. Now, I said I'll mention some of the monitoring. So I pulled in some of the some of um, the basics and perhaps ones that were really uh, covered in the water supply plants. Of course, we monitor for basic water chemistry in our source waters, whether um, the source water is surface water, groundwater, 
we look for nutrients, um, you know, those are compounds and minerals that could aid growth um, that could be naturally occurring or man-made. Uh, that's your nitrogen and phosphorus that could help then develop something like help, uh, harmful algal blooms, which again, Jen and um, the water supply plan talks about. Harmful algal blooms have been occurring more and more often through the United, um, United States altogether because of climate change. So as our climate is getting warmer, uh, these are more likely to occur. And so we have to have these strategies in place to be able to monitor and, and address them when they do occur in our source waters. Uh, in organic compounds and of course organic compounds like you know your your VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Um, the water supply talk, plan talks about 1,4 dioxin and PFAS. Um, you saw those uh, occurrence diagrams that Jen had. Uh, I, again, if you're interested in what's happening in New Jersey, the water supply plan has a good um, some good description on it. And also, what I recommend for any sort of water quality, uh, New Jersey DEP has this site and has some GIS resources, which have been incredibly helpful to us and I'm sure to many other water suppliers. Um, I think this has been around, they've organized it now and made it public and easy to access and easy to understand over the last couple of years. And it's been incredible. So if you haven't visited their website, but you're interested in water quality, um, whether it's the surface water or groundwater, um, again, encourage you to visit their website. There's a lot of good water quality data out there. Um, partnerships, right? I, I, as I said, um, source water protection cannot happen without collaboration and partnerships. So we like to collaborate with New Jersey DEP, our local governments, with the communities that we serve, um, businesses and industries, um, NGOs, uh, like like the many that we work with and um, individuals in the community. So New Jersey DEP has the source water assessment program, which is discussed in the watershed, um, not the, apologize, the water supply plan. Uh, and it talks a little bit about how it could be expanded or updated. So the source water assessment program was something that was required by the EPA back in the early 2000s. New Jersey DEP finished theirs in 2004, and it's now 20 years old. So those need to be updated in order to help continue to support the utilities and um, help and assess protect those drinking water sources. Uh, from that, there's also uh, DEP has a wellhead protection program, which also helps um, protect the groundwater part of our drinking water supplies and some of those rules um, around groundwater protection. Now. Again, we work with uh, with different partners throughout our communities to help protect the watersheds. Um, we I, I took this out, uh, I took screenshots out of our flyers. So we 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 have flyers for business partners, Office of Emergency Management partners. Um, you know, if we identify that there is a business or an industry in our watershed that could potentially have uh, a harmful or hazardous material that they're storing. We want to make sure that they know who to contact in case something goes wrong, in case there is a, a spell, um, so that they we are aware and we know what to do in case they do have one. How far are they? How would it impact us? And the same thing goes with our emergency management partners. We want to be able to know who we're talking to when an emergency occurs. Um, you know, create those um, opportunities to communicate so that uh, when there is an emergency, we already know each other and it's a little bit easier to talk through what, what needs to be done. Um, you know, we, we hope that you know, our emergency management partners invite us to any preparedness meetings, trainings, exercises, and we do that same. We try to meet with our partners at least once a year, again, just to meet in face-to-face, face -face, get to know each other. Um, so when an emergency does occur, we're not strangers um, you know, talking through uh, the phone or on Zoom where uh, we've met before and we, we kind of know what our strengths are and where we could help each other. Um, and of course, our community partnerships. So American Water has the Water and Environmental Grant Program. We just recently did an announcement. Um, we, we try to provide our communities especially want any organizations that are interested in protecting our watersheds and the environment around them. We have the Protect Our Watershed Art Contest. We have some other grant opportunities in there. We go out to the communities, visit schools, um, try to do open houses, 
offer plan tours. Um, Michael just asked me about that. If if you if you know of an organization, a school, university that's interested in a plan tour, uh, you could visit our website and uh, submit a request to do one. Um, again, we, we try to reach our communities the best that we can and are often out there volunteering for, um, for different events. So individually, what can you do? Uh, well, the one thing I like to say is that only rain should go down the drain, meaning the storm drain. Um, so, you know, number one thing is not to pour anything down the drain, down the storm drain. Um, at the end of the day, it can co um, contaminate soil and groundwater. And of course, if it, if it keeps moving, it'll eventually get through the surface water and your source water supply. So, you know, and again, pesticides or fertilizers are are the biggest individual contributors. So if you do have to use them, please follow the directions. Don't don't apply them right before rain. Um, that will wash off and eventually end up in your in your water, in your surface water supplies. And um, you know, it, depending on how much you use, it can end up in your groundwater as well. So be careful if you do have to use them. Uh, properly maintaining your septic system, dispose of medication properly. Again, there's very few medications that you could actually flush down the toilet. Please try to dispose of the medications properly. Um, you know, wastewater treatment plants do not treat for pharmaceuticals. So just keep that in mind whenever you flush anything down the toilet that's not supposed to be there. And of course, volunteering your community. Um, like I said, we try to get out. Uh, our employees try to volunteer uh, and do cleanups, and that absolutely helps um, with w cleaning um, or keeping our watersheds clean. So uh, one last plug, drinking water quality reports are out. If you are a New Jersey American Water customer, if you're interested in your drinking water quality report, it is on our website. Um, if you just go to our website, click on water quality and a job down comes down and you click on water quality reports. You could type in your zip code and find your water quality report. Really proud to, to do them. We want to show our customers what our water quality is. So again, um, they're out there. Every utility, every um, drinking water utility has to publish one, um, I believe by July 1st. We do ours earlier so that we can get them out to our customers. We pull up, put them in your bill messages. So you should be able to find your water quality reports. Again, if you're a New Jersey American Water customer, um, and I think that's it. Um, we'll see if I have, if there's any questions for me. All right. Great. Thank you, Laura. That is, was very interesting. Um, so far we do not have questions. I'm going to remind people to put questions in the Q and A. Um, I luckily have tons of questions, so <laughs> <laughs> Um, Laura, I'll start with you. Um, you know, obviously HABs and the forever chemicals are sort of the issues um, that are probably the most known. Um, salinity, salt, is that something that is starting to be of a concern or is a concern? So we're, we're fortunate in that in the areas that we serve, it is not yet a concern, but it's something that we're watching. Um, like Jen showed some of the data. We have uh, an intake on the Delaware River. Uh, it's not near the salinity line mm -hmm. yet. Um, it's not close. However, it's something that we want to keep an eye on and, and watch and work with our DRBC partners there. Uh, same thing with uh, 800 foot Sandy, uh, so the wells in those areas. Yeah, not a concern yet, but we're in that Cape May area, Atlanta County area. So we're, we're watching that. So I know uh, DEP just put out a couple new salt requirements under the new MS4 permit because I think uh, the, the the integrated report is showing that to start to be a problem, but luckily it hasn't yet made into our public water supply, um, <laughs> which is good. Um, Jen. Yeah. So the, the water supply plan talks about surface water, it talks about gr groundwater and uh, aquifers, uh, and it really deals with a public water supply. How does private wells, and I know good chunks of the state rely on private wells, they may not make up a majority of the actual customers of water, but how does that sort of play into the water supply plan? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So the water supply plan 
is looking at protecting aquifers and surface water to make sure that we have got uh, clean, safe, available water supplies. However, when it comes to your individual wells, so whether they're small community wells or they are your individual private wells, the testing requirements to make sure that's safe are really on you. And so there are a battery of tests that you can do. The most basic and fundamental ones are to make sure that the bacteria levels are safe. So you don't have fecal or E. coli. Um, so there are a, there's a schedule, and I don't have the link available right now, but maybe we can send that out to attendees later. Uh, there's a schedule of really what you should be looking to test every year and then every say three to five years. Now it's very context dependent. So if you live next to an apple orchard, you are going to want to test for certain parameters um, more frequently uh, than if you're not, because there are some chemicals, arsenic is one of them uh, that you'd want to look out for. Um, if you are in areas where arsenic is more naturally occurring, you want to look out for that more frequently to make sure it's not infiltrating your well. But the testing requirements are really on you. Once upon a time, there was legislation that was pending that never passed, um, but I'd love to, to see if we can't take it up again to make the, um, the cost of well testing deductible on your taxes. Because I think that's a great idea and would be an incentive for people to test their water uh, more frequently. Okay, good. All right. Um, you know what? I'll, I'll have another question for you, Jen. Um, sure. And so th this water supply plan was much different than the past, and it looked at uh, a much smaller sort of regions when it was looking at availability, a, a surplus and deficits. Um, can you can you sort of talk a little bit about that and how this was different and what sort of the overall picture from water supply is? Yeah, so we're taking a more detailed view. Um, when I say we, I, I really give all credit to the, the DEP staff and our consultants who put this plan together. Um, I'm talking of the larger New Jersey we. We're taking a more refined look at the availability of water and how we're using it and where it's going. Um, I've never been shy about calling administrations out when they uh, deserve to be called out and giving credit when they, they need credit. I will say that under the Christie administration, and this is this is public knowledge, the, the staff of the state of New Jersey were directed to not use the phrase climate change. Um, and so in addition to not being able to look at the impacts of climate change, there were also, um, I will say, certain approaches that were were taken to look at data in the previous plan versus this plan. Now that said, there's also more data that's available to us with this plan. With every iteration of this plan, we are gonna say, oh, we have more data now. This plan can be better. So if each subsequent plan is not driving down more and getting more detail, then it's up to us as advocates and users of water to really push against that and ask questions because with each iteration, we're going to know more, we're going to have more. And it's a, it's a no better, no more do better kind of situation. All right. Um, so Laura, um, and then I will leave it again. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q and A. Um, so do, do water suppliers, does New Jersey American Water get involved in land preservation or riparian zone restoration in order to protect water quality? Or is that not something on the radar within your powers? Well, certainly we work with our partners to help do that. Um, we, we don't pursue it ourselves, but uh, like I said, through our grant programs, through other ways of supporting our partners that do that, we, we're we're there helping helping others do that so that we could um we could write the benefit of of protecting our watersheds. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's good to sort of note uh, back in the early 2000s, 2004, New Jersey um passed the Highlands Water Protection Act, and the whole intent was that to protect the land, to protect water quality. Um 
So one of the sort of best ways, as Laura said earlier, is to keep the pollutants out of the water so water supply doesn't have to clean it. And having uh, open space and healthy vegetation is one of the best ways to sort of keep the pollution out of our waterways and make your job much easier in treating it. All right. Well, we're a little bit after one, and I don't see any questions. Um, so That's because we answered them all in advance, except for you. Yes. <laughs> that is always a good way. Um, so I will close out with um, a thank you to Laura and Jen. Thank you very much for giving us your time and expertise. Uh, Y'all, we have two more Technical Fridays coming up. Uh, one is uh, really different for us. We're looking at a international treaty to protect ocean bio biodiversity. That's on June 14th. And then we are anticipating a revision or an update to the New Jersey State Plan coming out uh, in the next week or so. So we're going to have a webinar on June 28th on that. Again, all of our webinars start at noon. Uh, and you can find more information on our website for that. So again, Jen, Laura, thank you very much. Everyone who attended, thank you. And everyone have a good day. Great. Thanks. Have a great weekend, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.